Okay, perfect. We're recording. I am so super excited to um, have our invited guest speaker, who is a part of our Women's History Month here at the university. Uh, and I want to thank Women's Studies and uh, the Department of Race, Ethnicity, Gender, and Sexuality Studies for helping me bring Fanny Cisneros to our class. Um, and her presentation is amazing. This is the flyer. I'll let her tell you more about that. But the title is San Anto Archives, Altars, Art, and Auto Historia in the Digital Age y Después. And this aligns perfectly with the assigned reading that we had by Maria Cotera. Uh, and it also aligns with the theme of our class. Um, so thinking about the classes about qualitative research and we're in the middle of unprecedented times we keep hearing, right? So um, using ethnic studies and women's studies, we're really learning about research by inquiring into ourselves. And so we're at a university. So there are very institutional ways to engage in research about ourselves, but there are also very, um, culturally rooted and ancestral ways of also researching ourselves in our community. And Bonnie's work really encapsulates that. So I'm gonna read uh, a bio uh, before we get into, um, or would you like to introduce yourself, Bonnie? That's fine, you can read the bio. Okay, so I'm gonna read the bio before we get into our presentation, but I'm so excited. And I would like to also add that I actually met Bonnie through online digital world and I've been following her ever since because her art, her music, her writing, it's just so reflective of San Antonio to me. And I was just telling her how I wish that I had been introduced to her artwork when I was a young person, just because that would be so liberatory to see that the things that I think about or that I'm interested in or the things that I do um, is um, legitimate and worthy of study and reflects uh, our communities. And so I'm so grateful uh, to have her here in real life. <laughs> and I'm also wearing, she's also an amazing jewelry maker. I'm also wearing some earrings I purchased from her. These are the made from the side of like mariachi pants, you know, those things. And I don't know what they're called exactly. Oh, and now they're, yeah, and now they're earrings and they're just the most beautiful. When I saw them, I just thought like, that person gets me and gets San Antonio. Oh, they're so cool. Anyway, so I'm excited for you to see all the different ways that Bonnie weaves together ancestral knowledge, um, institutional knowledge, literature, art, music, poetry. Um, and very methodologically in a way that reflects some of the themes that we're talking about in our class. Okay, so I'm gonna start the bio. So Bani Ilsa Cisneros is a fourth generation Tejana educator in a line of South Texas teachers. Bani holds a creative writing MFA from Texas State University, is a member of the Macondo Writers Workshop and was awarded a NALAC artist grant in 2018. Moonlighting as DJ Despineda. Despineda, she spins all vinyl soundscapes of the borderlands and consciously centers women and BIPOC musicians in her sets. Bonnie's poems and essays appear in El Retorno, Journal of Chicana Latina Studies, Porter House Review, um, Buckman Journal, River Teeth, a journal of nonfiction narrative, and El Placaso, Barrio Newspaper, which is here at San Anto Cultural Arts in the West Side. Her essay, The Anna Files, was anthologized in contemporary creative nonfiction, and she led a series of memoir workshops, which I was for 10, entitled Altering at the San Antonio Public Library. So thank you very much again, Bonnie, for being here with us. And I'm gonna start your reminder timer. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Mendoza, and um, your class for having me tonight. I've been working on this presentation for a good you know, I feel like I've been working on it my whole life, but I've been working on it for real for a month. And I, I, um, I'm just so happy to, to be here sharing with y'all. And um, I appreciate you, you being here. Um, my presentation is called Save As. Um, it took me a really long, like you sometimes titles just come, but this one, like it, it, it um, I needed to like, kind of net, like talk to my whole council with some of my community and like, they helped me with that save as, because I was like, you know, that idea when you have a digital file and they used to tell you like, don't forget to save, don't forget to save, remember, and you know, and like, and if you didn't save, sometimes you lost your work. So save as just really like kind of pulls that together for me. And um, I'm going to be talking about archives and altars and art and auto historia and auto doing theory um, in this digital age and y después because like I was telling Dr. Mendoza, I feel like just like if you, if you look at the flyer that was created by Linda Monsivais for this presentation, there's been so many ways that we've, you know, um, used technology um, and just pen and paper to document ourselves and to preserve our stories. And sometimes that stuff goes obsolete, right? It changes. So I feel like this digital age is, you know, this too shall pass. So I really feel like Linda um, just encapsulated that idea really just astoundingly in this artwork. Um, 
and I put her Instagram um, there on the on the screen for you so that you can follow her because she's an amazing like not just this but she she creates earrings she creates um, all kinds of she's a photographer she's just an amazing um, artist to know in San Antonio so um, that's her Instagram um, working through this let me see oh no <laughs> oh no really let's see is it the arrow i think it only accepts the arrow or okay yes thank you thank you so much okay so it's, i've been talking to my mom about this a lot too and i told her my whole like you know concept and she's like you should call it save and guess what emergency <laughs> and i'm like okay I'll, I'll put that in quotations or whatever uh saving guess or emergency um and i do feel like sometimes we're in an emergency to save ourselves you know so it made sense to me and then you know she's just uh she's just really funny so i i had to i had to include that um i i had this talk planned out like really meticulously but then i woke up this morning and i realized that today is april 1st and april 1st um two years ago my my grandmother passed away and i can't I, I would be just i have to like you know just kind of start off um talking about her i wrote a little something that i'm going to kind of dip i wrote an essay and i have my presentation and i'm going to kind of dip back and forth and i asked dr mendoza to jump in if she feels like there's anything that you know she'd like to like just make connections to y'all's class and stuff um, and then free, feel free to use the chat, um, the react, all that kind of stuff. I can't really see a chat right now, but hopefully we'll go back and, or you can let me know if there's something up that pops up. Um, so today marks two years since my abuela, the beautiful one with the bad heart, the genius one with the good stories, the crazy one with the cool style, died alone in her apartment in Edinburgh after too many close calls to count, literally. So many near misses with death that we joke with her that she had to, she had to have nine lives. All that landing on her feet and licking her wounds, a lifetime of death defying. But I'm not going to get into all that with y'all here today. I'm remembering her good side, her archives, from the neatly organized drawers full of letters and greeting cards she'd received over a lifetime, to laminated crayon drawings we'd made her as kids to her poems from the 70s, certificates and diplomas she earned later in life, enough photographs to tell the telenovela epic poem of her 79 years on earth. Where did she learn to document so meticulously? That's what I'm thinking about today as I attempt to share with you my own decades long project to document, preserve, collect, display and make sense of myself in this place in these times. I guess I need to introduce her, name her for you. Felicitas Minerva Longoria Villarreal. And I bet, I, bet, I bet more than a few of you have that person, complicated, extraordinary, both angelic and corrupt, that you love. Throw their name in the chat for us so we can see their names too. Go ahead. Many thanks to Dr. Mendoza for this extraordinary opportunity to share. <laughs> okay, hold on. <laughs> to share my stories with you. When I first read Cotera's article that she assigned for tonight, I had to text her immediately. Did you pair this article with me on purpose or am I just crazy? Turns out she did and I'm not. But by doing so, she unlocked another level in my ongoing creative, creative learning journey. Dr. Cotera, no, Cotera's articles have raised the bar for me. Maybe my own PhD path is straying towards archiving. All this time I've been working, learning, creating, knowing, and as Cotera states, that one's access to power determines one's presence in the archive. And one's presence in the archive shapes historical knowledge, which in turn informs the system of valuation that structures the priorities that govern collecting and preservation in institutions. Knowing that I have spent the past five years or so consciously documenting, drafting, dreaming, occasionally publishing, all the while knowing that without a book, my place isn't secure or respected like those names in the card catalog. Knowing that it's up to me to write, not just myself, but my comadres, the occasional compadre, into the story. My way, our ways, always. Digital tools such as Instagram, Facebook, Tumblr, Twitter have instigated community and linked kindred souls. No, about, no doubt about that. Dr. Mendoza just said it, we met on Instagram, right? 
In the reading, Cotera tells us of those eight inch floppy disks that became obsolete. And so I don't fully believe that these channels we're on are guaranteed. They don't feel permanent. Nothing is. Remember that where we're sitting today used to be a shallow sea. And we know that historical visibility, recognition, permanence are carrots that can be secured by an institution in the academy, but also that we must see with both serpent and eagle eyes, as Ansaldúa tells us in Borderlands. In Unpacking Our Mother's Libraries, which is another um, article by Cotera that Dr. Mendoza sent me, she says that in an Ansaldúan sense, we began to imagine the archive as both noun and verb, as a process of encuentro, and a, a path to conocimiento. There's so much to unpack in these articles, but I think the main concept that I'm taking with me after this is that indeed, as our collections reveal, remixing has been a central movida of Chicana memory practice since at least the 70s. An act of collection and curation that involves the thoughtful assembly and reinterpretation of existing cultural objects to make them relevant to contemporary audiences. Chicana remixing suggests an active mode of critical memory that takes existing knowledge, forms and reshapes them to derive new meanings. The creative genre mixing evident in Ansaldúa's Autohistoria can be thought of as a curation of sorts, one that has curative powers. So, um, this is a photo, I have this kind of a, a a ritual when I get ready to like um, to work on a project or to present that I kind of gather all my materials and I like to like lay them out right and like I in the past you know whatever ever since camera phones came about um, take snap a photo right so this is the photo that happened when um, I started working on this presentation and I and I printed out the article because I'm still old school I have to have a paper I like highlighting and taking notes on things or whatever um, and I had also at the same time been cleaning out my, my files and my papers and these, these, these watercolor illustrations popped out. And um, these, are drawn, these are paintings that my friend Sarah Castillo, the artist painted for me around 2011. Uh, we were working on a project and I had been thinking about my clothes and I was like, wouldn't it be cool? Like, can you just, let's see if, like what happens, whatever, if you'd like, you know, did some watercolors or whatever. So she, you know, just did these like, you know, like quickly and, and uh, off the cuff or whatever. And, and I saved them. And the other day I showed them to her, I texted her a photo and she's like, I can't believe you kept those. And I'm like, how would I not keep them? You know, like, it's just, they're so amazing. And how would I not keep them? So today I wore, I feel like it would be like a meta kind of thing if I wore <laughs> the garment that's in the painting. It's also in Linda's flyer. Um, so yeah. Um, let me move on. Okay, what did you say to do arrows? Yeah, I think in Zoom with the share, I think the arrows. Are okay. Um, I also need to move this over because it's blocking my, it's blocking me. I wish I could put it somewhere else. Um, Is it the view? Like a brief? Yeah, the view, I got it. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm sharing a map of South Texas um, and I want to kind of see like how many of you like claim South Texas like you are from South Texas you're either from San Antonio you're from the valley you're from Corpus this has Houston this includes Houston in it um, but we could debate that later but anyway like I just kind of want to see and I can't I can't see your chat right now because I'm sharing my screen but are there people from this area? Um, we have comments in the chat naming uh, Lily Martinez and Maria de Jesus Terrones Osorio from earlier when you asked. Mm -hmm. So far, we don't have folks claiming. Okay. Okay. Well, anyway, so here's South Texas. Um, yeah. I always like to kind of think about how, um, you know, you look at all that blue and all that ocean and how all that ocean used to cover where we're currently, you know, where we currently are, you know, where we're sitting now, the limestone is the bed of a, a shallow sea that was here you know a long long time ago and so when we think about change like that's just like the biggest like <laughs> metaphor for me that like nothing stays the same right we're, we're sitting where ocean used to be so um I always like to point that out and I also like to show this 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 map that you know um just shows our shows where we are 
you know, and um, our proximity to the water, our proximity to Mexico. And um, I always want to shout them out. So you, I wrote this little mantra, you and I can rectify centuries of amnesia and build altares out of our own archives. We can collaborate with each other and make art. We can share resources and remix knowledge from our ancestors to pass on to our descendants. Um, I always also have to say something, um, good gratitude to Gloria and Saldua. Um, I wasn't, I wasn't, I was in my late thirties in grad school when I learned the term autohistoria. Um, we didn't ever read Ansaldua in school. You know, it wasn't until I was working on my thesis that I pulled her book, um, Light in the Dark and, and, and started reading that I learned this term and I'm like, that's what I'm doing. Like, I didn't even know, like, so autohistoria, um, uh, writers of Auto Historia Teori, Teoria blend their cultural and personal biographies with memoir, history, storytelling, myth, and other forms of theorizing. They create interwoven individual and collective identities, um, uh, new stories of healing, self-growth, cultural critique, individual, collective transformation. So when I learned these terms, it's like a light bulb went off for me. I'm like, I'm not just doing creative nonfiction. I'm not just doing essays. I'm doing Auto Historia. So, um, this is, I, I have this saved and I always kind of refer to it and, and, and reference it. Um, another book that I came across, you can see the little half price clearance sticker. It was just, I had never heard of this book. It was just on the shelf. Like, I feel like waiting for me, my history, not yours. It's the formation of Mexican American autobiography. And um, I feel like just the title alone tells us like the formation of Mexican American autobiography. And you have a photo of a woman. So this is like during like, you know, somewhat modern times that, Mexican Americans even existed, right? So like after the after the Mexican War, you know, people who were Mexican living in Texas and in the Southwest became American and Mexican Americans just sort of like, or this new like group. And so to, to be able to like write their stories, there's this quote here, I'm willing to relate all I can remember, but I wish it clearly understood that it must be in my own way and at my own time. I will not be hurried or dictated to. It is my history and not yours I propose to tell. And that's um, Mariano Vallejo in, from California in 1875. So that whole idea of like, this is my history, not yours. I mean, when we were in school, I feel like they were teaching us their history, not ours, right? So this is like the flip, the flip side of that. And so this book is really like, I really, I recommend it. Um, if you're interested in, um, yeah, the formation of, of autobiography for Mexican Americans, like this is like a, a, a good starting point. Um, my whole life, you know, growing up in San Antonio, you know, Bonnie Cisneros, like people ask me, like, you know, are you related to fill in the blank? You can fill in the blank with a couple of names there. And I'm always like, no, no, no. Well, in this process where I um, was working on my thesis um, my, at the MFA, I, again, hadn't really read much on Saldua and I was reading one of one of the chapters in the book and like I had set up my office outside because I had a really small house and I had two babies and my mom was living with us and I, anyway I would work outside under the tr under the bamboo and um, I was reading and I just sort of something just happened and it dawned on me like I knew that like my great grandmother, this one here, um, who raised me I knew her mother was Sofia and Saldua. And I knew that, you know, that, that they were born and raised on, on ranches outside of Edinburgh, um, but I never really like whatever. And it wasn't until I was working on my thesis that I did a little like digging and family tree and ancestry and whatever. And I found out that, um, so Gloria's great, great grandparents, Dona Urbano and Dolores Ansaldua are also my great, great, great grandparents. Um, <laughs> and, uh, so yeah, I mean, it's something that I don't really like, I've never really talked about or like, I don't really like whatever, but just, it just confirmed to me, like I'm on Salduan at heart, you know? And um, it's not knowledge that I grew up with, but it's knowledge that now that I have it, like, it just seems like, it just seems like almost like magical realism in a way, you know? But going back, I've always been a pet, what my mom calls a pack rat of artifacts. Um, a hoarder of memories. I, I, um, I just always um, couldn't throw stuff away. And like, I'm not saying like, you know, I'm, I'm talking like little, little things that um, 
to me, they're valuable, you know, like, here's my, this is my great grandmother who, like I mentioned before, like she, she helped raise me. She was a teacher in the Valley for 55 years. And she, um, towards the end, she got diagnosed with a, um, ALS or Lou, Lou Gehrig's disease. And so for the last couple of years of her life, like she lost her ability to speak and she would write little notes, you know? So the summer before she died, I was in seventh grade and I went to stay down there with her in Edinburgh. And, um, I'd gotten in trouble or whatever. And so my mom sent me down there and uh, she would write little notes and stuff. And so this one, Bonnie, there's a fly in my room driving me crazy. I've tried to kill it, but I'm too slow. Will you, will you go and kill it? You know, like, it's just such a like simple thing, but at, you know, at, at 12 years old or however old I was, 12 or 13, I knew to keep this little paper, you know, it's like her handwriting and it's just this moment in time where she, cause you know, this Moscow's driving her crazy or whatever. So I, I kept it and, and I'm so glad I did, you know, and then um, I just have other things here that are from my from my path, you know, um, that sort of represent like papers that, you know, maybe some people would throw away or not really, I don't know, um, value, but I, for some reason, it was just some, like something I, I did and something I, always, I have always done. Um, going back to the to the reading for tonight, Nuestra Autohistoria Toward a Chicana Digital Praxis. Um, that quote right in the beginning, like I, I was so amazed that Maria and Marta, like that Maria is the daughter of Marta and they're both like, it's just, it's such, it's so cool, you know? And that whole quote, we are what we decide we are. Like that really like hit home for me because like, I, I, I'm like, who am I? You know, like, I thought about, well, who am I? I'm like, okay, well, I'm, I'm Bonnie Ilsa Cisneros and I start going back in, in, you know, in the, in the Mexican tradition of going back into your, Ancestors' last names, Biarria, Loriva, Longoria, Solis, Cavazos, Ansaldua, Ayarzagoitia. I'm, I'm a mother. I'm Mila and Lunita's mother. I'm Tejana, Chicana. And if I'm going to decide who I am, I mean, I'm, I'm DJ Despeinada, right? Like, I, um, I became a DJ. And DJ, in DJing, you know, you choose your name. You know, you create this, like, kind of like an identity or whatever. So I became DJ Despeinada. And... Um, let me see if I go should go back to this. Let's see. Okay. So I'm gonna kind of go back into the essay for a moment. Um, while reading, I had a few light bulb moments about my own pack rat tendencies and how I inherited the need to squirrel away artifacts, papelitos grandmother's photo albums, letters, drafts, clipped articles, etc. I'm a collector of vinyl, books, thrifted and gifted clothing, jewelry, folk art, plants, cositas. Cotera recalls her own mother's sprawling archive and how she saved everything and collected in order to have an evidence of Chicana presence. Like that evidence of Chicana presence, like I never knew, I mean, like I never thought about it that way, you know, to think about why am I, why document why preserve why you know like gather and like to to well it's it's to gather evidence right and when we aren't included in the canon and that could be literature it can be art it can be even history if we are excluded from that i can see how like maybe over the generations this like this this need to like collect evidence of our of our existence maybe that's how it happened you know for me i don't know maybe that's how it happens for a lot of us um we're we're, we're gathering evidence of our presence um when i approached linda the artist about the poster um commission i i told her that and I, I'm quoting from my email. All I know is that I want to connect the readings with what we have been doing during, quarant during quarantine, rebuilding the world, remixing the archives and doing all the memory work. So um, I quoted Judy Smith from one of the articles. You don't think your way into a different way of acting. You act your way into a different way of thinking. So um, archives are an act of love. Altars are an act of remembrance. Art is an act of love. Auto historia is an act of remembrance. So here I have another one of my little scenes from when I was recording um, a radio show. Um, and again, like it was a Valentine's show. So I gathered all my books on love, my love poems, 
um, I set my little, I, I, it's almost like I made, make a little stage for myself, even if it's just me doing the work. Um, and this is, this is, I know that a lot of us, you know, our, our desk and our work, our workspace is our own little, it can be like a little altar, you know? Um, there's another, the other article that if you haven't, I don't know if, if Dr. Mendoza um, assigned it, but the other article by, by Maria Cotera, the Unpacking Our Mother's Libraries, that one is just, is really, really good too. I would really recommend, like, I hope y'all, like, if you haven't read it, I hope, like, you should read it. But um, it, it starts with this quote, every passion borders on the chaotic, but the collector's passion borders on the chaos of memories. Um, and like, so I have my bulletin board here above my desk and like, I, I can see like how that, you know, for me, it makes sense, you know, like all these things together on a bulletin board, like that's, it's almost like my dream board and my vision board, but I can see how somebody looking out, looking in would be like, it, it looks kind of chaotic maybe um, to y'all, I don't know, um, but what I'm trying to say is, you know, at this point in your, in your, in your studies and in your, in your academic life, like if you don't have that space right now for your desk and your, and your bulletin board and, and like, the, and your little, your little work space or whatever, strive for that. You know what I mean? Like, like find it at some point, you know, you you will have it, you know, and then you can, you can like um, surround yourself with, what matters to you, like where you, evidence of like, again, evidence of your presence, evidence of where you come from and, and where you're going. So I just, I'm, this is a very intimate photo for me to share, but I, I really thought that it was very um, appropriate for what we're talking about. Um, here's another quote, more than simply archives, these collections suggest modes of critical documentation and memory that bridge multiple polarities. Constituted through both practice and theory, they are intensely personal, but also invested in collective transformation. So this is just a little section of my bookshelf. Um, and, you know, again, like chaos, contained chaos, you know, to me, it's like, I can see that here's my, these are, these are places I've been published. These are my publications. These are my like, you know, Tejana, Chicana kind of like um, sources, resources, this is like more of that. These are all zines, you know? So like, it makes sense to me, um, my books. Um, I also collect vinyl, I'm a DJ, I'm a vinyl DJ. So um, my records are also um, part of my archives. Collections like, and then this is another quote, collections from my mothers are not uncommon among the Chicanas with whom I have been conducting oral history since 2009. In fact, there are regular features of their domestic space, much the way in the way that altares might have been for their mothers and grandmothers a generation before. So when I read that, it really like um, I just it just like a light bulb went off to me that that the archive and the altar are like they're 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 connected, right? Um, and when I think about like my DJing life and like how I create, how I do my setup, my tables, my turntables, and I bring like things from home, like plants and just things or whatever, I feel like that is also an altar that I create in the space wherever I may be. DJing um, is like that. So here um, I started working, I started DJing about 10, almost 11 years ago. And after the first couple of years, like photos would pop up here and there, there'd be photographers. Here's, here I am at the Guadalupe. I started out there a lot and a photographer would show up and take a photo and I'd be like, wow, that's cool. You know, like I can like remember this gig or whatever. Well, after a while, like they didn't always show up. So after a while I made a, a point of documenting each and every gig, like i made a point of that. And, it, and, it, and when I think about it, it's almost like I was trying to like prove that this dream, like this dream of like, I'm a DJ, you know, I'm a working DJ is real you know and now that like the pandemic has um totally changed you know it's changed everything but like my life my life my work kind of got like it, it, it did seem like a dream and i'm so glad i did it you know um we would arrive to the gig my husband would come with me a lot of the times um load in set up sound check and then usually i would tell carlos can you take my pictures, you know, once everything was like set up or whatever. And I'm so glad I did because I'm like, here I'm pregnant on the Hay Street Bridge, you know, like there's just, and this is just a little like fraction 
of of this is kind of early years or whatever but um I'm so glad I did it you know because I feel like it's it's again like proof of my existence um I also early on started like fig figuring out that DJ sets can be educational spaces too and not just in the like you know when there's kids around they're so curious they come and they like what is that oh my god well, you know they want to like you know they want to see what is this. some of them have never seen a record or whatever so I don't just mean in the in the obvious way like educational spaces but just the whole like um people coming up and asking you know oh my god what song is that or oh, what, you know, you got to tell me, you know, what album is this or whatever? I've never heard this. And so like, I, I learned often too, that like, you know, traditionally DJs have been like confined to the DJ booth, like away from the public or whatever, but I, um, I never was. And, and people talk to me. And so I talk, I talk to them. That's part of the job or whatever. So here's another quote, while they carefully document the past, they're also deeply engaged with the present and even the future. And while they represent the traces of a particular intellectual and political development, they're also an active and disruptive space of collective remembrance and identity formation. So pretty soon, pretty early on also, I, I started, I decided like, I'm going to center women musicians, women artists in my sets. Um, and I'm going to center artists of color, you know, uh, black and um, Latin artists. And I'm gonna, I just, it's something it's it's what I like to hear anyway it's not like you know almost like doing anybody a favor and and I decided like you know the, in these spaces a lot of the time you know in a male-dominated field they play mostly male artists so um I, I made a point of of disrupting that space right um social media as an archive and as a teaching tool I am no longer I haven't been on Facebook since before the election but I've kept my Instagram, even though I deactivate sometimes. And I feel like Instagram, especially like has, has been a really good way for me to arc, not only archive um, my, um, my knowledge and my experiences, but also as a teaching tool. Um, I am able to share, you know, like little mini lessons sometimes using, using social media. And I think that's really, it's, it's really, it's really cool. You know, um, another quote, a digital archive is an active space of exchange and encuentro between the present and the past. There's the potential to enact new strategies of alliance and a new praxis, praxis of Chicana feminism at the intersection of digital and analog culture. I mean, that's exactly what, exactly what I feel like my Instagram did for me. Um, and then, um, I had to talk about clothes for a minute. Um, and going back to my grandmother, another inheritance, another, another thing I inherited from her is the thrift style. She was, a, she was very much into clothes and very much, you know, she thrifted, um, dressing with intention, having fun with style sustainably, frugally as a Chicana, no matter my age or size, my body is a canvas upon which I can create visual moods, motifs, and moments. My closet is another type of archive a place where clothing is sorted and stored. It's my own private gold mine. This is just a little snippet of my closet, but um, I feel like our clothing can also be a way of connecting to the past and expressing our identities and our cultures and our um, ancestral sort of like, you know, um, our just roots through clothes and when you find stuff in thrift stores like they have each piece has its own backstory too it, it was in part of someone else's life too so i really love that idea um and then admittedly i am an earring addict <laughs> anybody who knows me i make them i wear them i buy them i'm just really uh, these pictures that i took i didn't stage so they look a little messy uh, i just i i didn't like i could have whatever made it look better but this is what I did. And so um, handmade crafty earrings, vintage statement pieces, pulga hoops, earrings frame the face and are the cherry on the top of the outfit. Like, I feel like I always wait till the end, like most of us do to put on the, whatever it's gonna be, right? My archive of aretes are keys to my past. Each pair has an origin story. It's highly charged with energy from wearing them at important moments infused with power, really. I feel like they give you the power. And, uh, Dr. Mendoza's mariachi earrings, she was mentioning, um, I had a, I had thrifted a mariachi jacket, you know, and uh, 
I wore it one time. And after that, I was like, man, you are a poser. You cannot wear that jacket and not be a mariachi, right? Like, it's like, it's like, you can't do it. So I'm looking at the jacket. I'm like, man, I'm never going to wear this again. You know, and it's kind of like a cheap polyester blend or whatever. It's not like whatever. And I'm looking at the hardware and I'm like, oh my God, and I did this put it, put it up to myself. And I'm like, these are like great earrings. So like, that's where that came from. But again, just being like remixing, right? Remixing these, um, cultural like symbols right the mariachi symbols of the, of the botonadura and like and making it into something else and like i didn't feel like a poser wearing them as earrings like i would have on the jacket um i wanted to talk about selfies because we're talking about chicana presence you know and um i feel like so my archives are peppered with selfies and though camera phones have made this ability to document particularly particular looks or moments easily the women in my family have long taken self-portraits using Polaroids, photo booths, and mirrors. And I'm not ashamed of this tendency to want to document myself. Um, I think of my daughters in the future flipping through my photo albums and I, it just makes sense to me. Um, so um, I, I, th I was thinking about photo booths and how like before camera phones, you know, photo booths were a way to like instantaneously um, document yourself, right? And so I have like, this is like, this is my grandmother here. Um, this is my mother. And then this is me. Um, and I, I don't know, there's something so magical about entering a photo booth and, and being able to just, um, I don't know. I, um, I have a lot of more examples, but this was a last minute kind of addition. So I just, I, I needed to throw it in for y'all. Another quote from the article, to be in the academy, but not of it, on my own personal, like, professional life, you know, I started out as a public school teacher here in town, a middle, a middle school teacher, I was there for five years, I went into, um, I worked at San Antonio Cultural Arts, um, I was a Placaso newspaper coordinator, and then um, I lost my job, and I was pregnant, and I thought, what am I going to do now, like, so I went to grad school and uh, had my kids and had my, you know, went, went through grad school. And then, you know, I graduated after, I took four years to do the, the three-year program and everybody asked me, what are you gonna do now? What are you gonna do now? You did an MFA, like creative writing. What are you gonna write a book? What are you gonna, what are you gonna do? And I'm like, well, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna write, I'm gonna apply for grants and I'm gonna try to do, uh, you know, workshop, I'm gonna teach workshops and I'm gonna try to lecture at the university. So this is my first like lecture at the university step because I've done the other stuff. And I, I've, I've done one other presentation for a, for a college class, but it was you know with another person. Um, so this is my first solita and I'm just like, yeah, okay, it happened, you know. Um, I've taught at the library. I, I did a, 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 a workshop with um, Sarah Castillo and Lorian Guerrero. I did a, a, a solo um, workshop at the Latino collection called Altering, which um, Dr. Mendoza was a, a participant in and we published a zine. And I mean, and then here's my Instagram, you know, like um, you, sharing recipes even, I think um, scholarship grounded in the lived experience of Chicanas create a world where knowledge reaches outside of the academy. So Instagram is a way to like, you know, you share a recipe and like, um, you know, you're teaching, so. Um, another part of my path has been this, you know, community that I have um, been so blessed to be part of various communities over the years, and some of them start in bars, you know, um, as an Dominguez is a mentor of mine, she owns Salute International Bar on the St. Mary's Strip, and um, Rebel um, Mariposa of La Botanica also became a very dear um, comadre of mine, and um, I did gigs there. This is like these women owned businesses or places, Lucha Lord Bar too, where I was able to, um, cause I don't DJ in bars for the most part. Like I'm not in the bar scene, club scene, like late at night kind of stuff, but these places were safe spaces. They were owned by women and, and, and they um, um, were places where community could gather and we can meet each other and we could plan events and festivals and, and cute little things. And, and, um, and, and so, you know, finding that community is really like really, I mean, it's everything in terms of like your um, building and your creating and your um, archiving yourself. So scholars of Chicana history have long observed how the relative in invisibility of Chicanas and in institutional archives has structured absences in our collective historical knowledge. 
about the central role they have played in shaping various movements, movement ideologies and practices. It can be as simple as migas. <laughs> um, so amigas is like a metaphor to me, like it's an ancestral recipe um, for finding your own nourishment, feeding your community, delighting your senses with your own combination of ingredients and methods of memory preservation. So, I mean, I can kind of expand on this, but I just definitely want to share my meat. Like we have chickens, so these are our chickens eggs and and migas has been, is a way for me to like, really like, I don't know, feel like everything's, you got everything's represented, right? You got the corn, the tomate, the onion, and the chile and the egg, and it just all like, it all comes together. So that takes us to, I don't know if we need to like, um, do we need to catch up on the chat or is anything jumping out to you? Right in the chat that those corn tortillas are the truth. That's the only brand <laughs> I buy of corn tortillas. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Natalie said she loves when her mom makes migas. And that's true. Like, I make migas for myself, but my mom's like, they just get mm -hmm. uh, We have lots of like, yay. Yes, I love that. This is beautiful. Uh, I also said thrifting is a form of remixing. So I think that's just so cool. And then we have folks from the Valley, South Texas, SA, who claim uh, South Texas. Cool. Okay. Um, I'm going to quickly go through this part because I know we're kind of running short, shorter on time. But um, so when the pandemic hit, like I said, like it felt like my life came to a complete halt. So, you know, as an independent like artist and, and DJ, like, you know, life just, I was like, what am I going to do? You know, like there's nothing, I don't know. Like I felt like I was obsolete. And so um, the only place I would go to in the beginning was Evergreen Garden on, on Hildebrand because I was working on my on my veggie garden because I thought, I mean, remember there was like panic of like, what's going to happen, you know? So I was like, I need to learn, I need to grow my own food. So Evergreen was the only place I would go. And the owner, Edward Bella, and I started becoming friends. And he said, you know, around, I guess it was around summertime, he was like, why don't you do a gig in the garden? You know, why don't you just come and like set up and you can do a gig here and whatever. And I'm just like, you know, I was really like yearning for that connection because I had been streaming um, DJ sets online and they were getting kicked off because of copyright. And so I felt really like I missed it, you know? And so I thought, yeah, we can be masked. We can be distanced. He can make me a little cave of plantas or whatever. And so this Siempre Verde is what we call, I called it, um, became this, this whole other ecosystem. Um, and from the very beginning, I knew I was like, I want to commission a poster to commemorate to commemorate each month's event, right? And so I started out Linda Monsi Vice again. She did the first one for me here, and um, I I say commemorate because I wasn't trying to lure people. Like usually posters are advertisements, right? Come and come to our gig. I was like, no, I'm not trying to. <laughs> I don't want a lot of people there, you know. But um, I I want to commemorate it. I want to remember that this is what we're doing in quarantine in the garden, right? So. The project has like this is we're already on like the tenth month, but these are some of the some of the, these are the first uh, eight months of artwork. Um, they're all by Sananto artists, um, and they are all incredible. You know, um, some of them um, I the concept appears in my mind, like this one. Sometimes it doesn't, like this one. But um, every time, I mean, I'm just wowed. I'm just like floored by this the artwork that comes out of uh, has come out of this project um i print them i give them away to guests at the garden um, um this was this was the snowstorm this was the snowstorm month that this one came about um from the article this is a, a bailey talks about collaborative consent which is a non-hierarchical circular collaboration digital tools widen the audience but more importantly shift power dynamics between those being studied and those doing the study making meaning about their findings so collaborative consent like that's just like it was like I, another light bulb moment where i'm like wow here we are doing these collaborations with these commissions i want to make sure that they're consensual they're respectful they're um non-hierarchical like just because i'm the one doing the commissioning and they're doing the artwork like it's it's all we're all like on an even you know um, playing field or whatever so this one's a really amazing one this was our this was our latest um our latest poster i think i mean every month they're getting like i can't like they don't i'm like how can they top themselves i don't know um but this whole idea in the, mentioned in the article if not us who and if not now when and i think of that a lot i think if not if not us who 
if not if not us who if not now when like yeah now now is all we have right we don't have to wait for institutional approval to hit save on our knowledge to self-publish to recover and preserve discover complexities and interconnections of our histories and build our worlds I also like, <laughs> I'm really proud of this outfit. So it was a salsa theme or whatever um, you saw from the poster and I played all salsa music and I wore my chiles or whatever. So I was like, I really wanted to show. <laughs> I just show that because I had the mocajete earrings. And I Those had the earrings. <laughs> so cute they're pa they're hand painted canvas let me shout her out her name is uh the shop is called luna sangre she's on instagram luna sangre shop and she has an etsy and she does amazing their canvas paintings and they're all kind all kinds of stuff but i have a few pairs of hers that just i'm like these are i mean archival right quality um also my some friends of mine some artist friends of mine have had their commissions open during quarantine because they you know again they everybody had to like shuffle and hustle and so these commissions um have been also so cathartic you know like just these amazing artworks that have come out of of of, of my of friends open open commissions and um i'm just really like wow uh, this is uh, one of my favorites too it's a portrait uh family portrait where i asked uh, sheila vasquez uh to do a uh, intergenerational matrilineal portrait um at boca chica beach um and to include the animals to include the like you know sea oats and like whatever and i uh, just i love this one a lot um the project siempre verde has also morphed into a journalism experiment um if you saw my website if you go under Siempre Verde, and you click on an artist, I've had the opportunity to interview a lot of them. Um, and shout out Diana Lopez from Southwest Workers Union for inspiring me to do so. Uh, but this is a little excerpt from Linda's, um, Linda's in, um, interview. And uh, I always like make a point of like, the day it's published, I look up and find someone's birthday to like honor that day. Um, I've done everything from Beyonce to like Audre Lorde. Um, and so um, I'm really proud of this part of the, of the project because some of these artists have never been interviewed formally. And so it's just like an honor to be able to publish them on my website where I didn't, I was like, I have a website. I can publish whatever I want, you know? Like I don't have to wait for like the current or the whatever to, to publish these, publish what I wanna publish, right? And, and, and give voice and space to these artists who are so amazing. So this has been a really like almost one of my favorite parts of the project. Um, so like the emergence of photography, uh, the emergent technologies, standards, and approaches of the web 2.0 environment have created new modalities of information sharing and collaborative authorship that disrupt conventional notions of expertise and authority. Um, this is something I was doing these little tips, you know, um, I mean, a lot of us do this we save good containers, we save the bags or whatever, but I'm thinking like, maybe some people don't. So I'm like, let me do a post about it. You know, maybe like some people don't and lo and behold, you know, like people are like, hey, look, you know, like I'm doing it too. Somebody posted on their story or whatever. So I was like, just that, just that, you know, her saving her bean bag and putting her alocata in it from my post to me is like, that's enough for me. You know, like, I mean, I don't, you don't, you don't know what your, um, who you're going to like, effect or whatever, but just knowing that one person was affected, like, I'm like, okay. Uh, I wanted to share with you also really quickly, insurgent, are we like running out of time? I'm so excited that you're showing these handles because I follow them for the same reason because they're archivists. Um, yes. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so um, Instagram, like, I mean, there's, yeah, there's there's archivists on Instagram. There's, and they're insert the term insurgent, right? They're not part of an institution. They're not part of an academy, yet they are archiving online, right? And so these are my top ones, the Veteranas and Rucas. If you just look at their little, you know, photo archive, Para Las Mujeres is SoCal, reframing and reshaping our past by sharing our stories. I mean, okay, San Fernando two stories. This is all about San Fernando Cemetery and this person, he's, I think he, he chooses to remain anonymous, but he goes out there and cleans the headstones and tell and looks into the stories of the of the people, pulls their death certificates, pulls newspaper articles, and shares these stories of these people buried in San Fernando online. Like it's amazing, right? Um, the Rock Archive, Archivo LA, they uh, um, an archive of rock 
in Los Angeles, the Collective Archive for Rock and Complicit Genres. So like flyers, stuff like that from LA, which we had one for San Antonio. Um, inheritance, all about different cultures and their um, ana anas ana anachronistic celebration of the diversity, complexity, and creative people of color and how we choose to, and I think it's something about their hair, but amazing, it's a great one. Um, and the Abuelita Chronicles, a heartfelt project dedicated to abuelas, women who paved the way, stole our hearts, and blessed us with their wisdom. And the Frontera Collection, of course, is the Arhuli Foundation de dedicated to documenting, preserving, presenting, disseminating, and celebrating regional roots music and its makers. So if you have a topic, if you have an interest, you can dig around and find it. Like if it's crocheting or if it's woodworking, whatever it is, if it's, you know, Egyptian history, whatever it is that is your passion, like you could, there's a, probably an archive for it. And so I would recommend dig around and find, find your own faves. Oh, these are the other two. Uh, the, I don't know how to say it, Fisheraz. It's a digital archive dedicated to preserve legacy of vintage showgirls from Latin America and the Caribbean and beyond. It's just, it's an amazing one. Um, and then the Sananto original, um, posting pictures of Sananto from the past, anything before 2000. So um, just these incredible pictures and stories pop up on, on that one too, and it's local. And, um, it's amazing. So, I made this beam early quarantine. <laughs> it's a, a a poppy, like a caterpillar with a poppy, and uh, you know, um, I'm the I'm the caterpillar. And books, music, research, conversations, recipes, and style are all my nectar or whatever. Um, and there's that quote again: "There can be little doubt that one's access to power determines one's presence in the archive." So it's up to us to like, we don't if we don't have the power necessarily, we can still um, shape the kind of history that should be should be written. The chicanapormirasa.org, I looked into it, um, Cotera's project or whatever, that's an amazing, another amazing website um, resource. I, I I, was like, I want to be part of this. So <laughs> like, wow, this is incredible. So um, if you haven't dug around that, that website, it's very, very amazing. Um, it refuses to ask for recognition. And instead, we want to take apart, dismantle, tear down the structure that right now limits our ability to find each other and to see beyond. So what a mission statement, right? Um, I'm on Twitter, but I never tweet, but I did find this article the other day, it was published on the Harvard Review um, called On the Need for Aesthetic Wildness. And um, it talks about feminist memory. And like, I really, I really recommend this, this essay. Um, feminist memory is not celebrating, celebrating or enshrining. It is not apologizing, justifying, discounting, or my little thing is like messed up here. It is keeping things on record alongside each other in a state of tension or bewilderment or anguish or war if need be, all the questions, wounds, scabs, alive, pulsing, made visible. Um, we just came through a natural disaster last month. I mean, I, I, there's no other word for it. You know, the snow really just, I mean, it was, it was shocking. It was beautiful. It was scary. It was like sublime, right? And a lot of us, I mean, I knew people who didn't have water for 17 days, like it's, it was a lot. And so we're still processing, we're still in the pandemic. We are still processing the snowstorm. Um, but I wanted to show you, I have this um, ancestral nopal that is, it was a little baby that I cut off from my, when we visited my grandmother's, um, we have access to the cemetery, the ranch where my grandmother was born, but I, it's, 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 it's that nopal from Edinburgh. And um, I forgot about it. I brought my plants in, but I forgot about this one because it's so hardcore. It's in the corner of the yard where I didn't remember it. And um, it melted it like afterwards, it was just like, we've seen so many of the cactuses around town that are just, they look dead, but I went to see it the other day and I saw all these babies. All these babies are coming out like crazy. And I was, it made me, it was such a beautiful metaphor to me, you know, that like, you know, we, we've gone through something like really hardcore, really terrible and like, you know, sometimes tragic, but we're resilient, you know? Um, and this quote, what I'm trying to say is that feminist memory is not totalizing. It's an ever expanding, dispersed, breathing archive of acts of remembering and re-remembering, remembering with, against, alongside, despite, in the name of, in the face of, in the space, in that moment, acts of remembering and acts of for, refusing to forget. So I refuse to forget um, I carry my archive with me. 
Um, the book is a luxury when the stories are disappearing. The scholars who do not take it seriously as a theoretical proposition because it's not a book. So what, it's not a book, you know? Um, it's still valuable. And so we're the historians, the history makers, the storytellers, the archivists, the artists that presently, um, this is from um, a email from Dr. Mendoza to me telling me about, you know, this project, this class, um, this lecture. And so I thought it would be a really nice way to kind of, um, to remind us, to remind y'all that you're the expert of your life. You know, you do this work on the daily, some, some of you through social media, through your art, you create playlists and, uh, and you're doing it and you have to keep doing it, you know, um, and sharing it. So these are my work cited in Queso Emergency. I had to pull that back in uh, if you were interested in, in reading more. Um, and yeah, um, that's it. That's 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 the presentation. Uh, I had more, but I, I always over prepare. <laughs> Yay, so amazing. Thank you so much. I mean, essentially, and I'll let students like take some time while I make this comment to like develop your questions. Yes. And I'm sorry, my dog is on one right now. No problem. <laughs> Essentially, you are like your own museum of like art and culture and history of San Antonio. If you look at, and hopefully you'll share with us the presentation, like your presentation in itself is like, I love that you used ecclesystem. It's like a connection to so much history and activism and organizing specifically by women and women of color. Um, that is just so useful. I mean, if we look at the panel of your flyers and I bought a bunch of those flyers, you are pretty much documenting like safe spaces for women and queer folks. You're documenting a bar that existed, one of the only few like lesbian bars in San Antonio, right? You're documenting your collaboration with women of color from San Antonio who are artists. And so many of us here probably couldn't name artists before your presentation, right? Locally, maybe we can name one or two, but just from the stuff that you've been doing, like we have access to your website where we can learn about like multiple artists, right? And the work that they're doing in collaboration with you. I'm just so grateful for your like mind and your like ganas to do all of this. Cause I mean, as a professor too, I think like, wow, like if I go to this website, there's the history about artists. There's like literature, there's books, there's your own works that are accessible to anybody. I'm just so blown away by you doing this. Um, and just making the knowledge like accessible to like the community outside of official institutions. You just need online access, right? To your Instagram account. And I also think it's so amazing that like, if we think in Western thinking, like we could easily um, diminish the practices of women of color, right? Uh, but if you follow all the artists who are making jewelry and who are making the earrings that you wear, like it's a whole network and a community of folks um, who are also involved in like mutual aid organizing, right? Like there's this whole lineage of uh, mujeres like taking care of the community, producing art, and also you're documenting joy. You have women who are, are creating music and creating spaces where they can like also have fun. They don't have to be like fighting all the time, which we, we do because we have to, right? Um, but they're also like listening to music and jamming out. I mean, that's just, I'm just so grateful for what you do. Okay, now stop gushing. Oh my God, okay. <laughs> yeah. If folks have any questions, please feel free to ask them or share any comments or thoughts or even recetas. I love how you ended with the nopal. Like the nopal itself is like an archive. My mom had a rose bush that her grandma had given her. And I remember being younger thinking like, wow, that shit's alive. Like I never met her, but like her plan is here. Like, that's so wild yes. to me. So yes. even that uh, plant clipping is like an archive. Um, so yes, thank you so much for what you do. Okay, now stop. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. I don't know if I should stop share so that I can see. I just don't want Linda's art to go away, but let me see. Um, so I'm gonna stop share. Okay, there. Okay. Now I can see the group and I can see the chat. Okay. There's a question at the bottom about uh, the earrings. So what made you want to start making earrings? And I would also like to hear about your methodology about, I mean, we heard the really cool story about the mariachi, but some of the other things you have, like yours, that, like I bought one that is a, a succulent. Um, mm -hmm. It's a potted succulent. So yeah. 
I think what started me with, with, with craft, I mean, I've always been crafty, right. But like making actual earrings, definitely I was inspired by the, the creators that I follow on Instagram that, that, that that's their main gig, right. They sell earrings, they have a shop um, and they, they, they pop up at markets. And so I was always a fan of a lot of different um, jewelers. Right. And I, I, it inspired me to think outside the box like when I saw those mariachi, when I had those pieces and I was like, I don't want this jacket anymore. And I put them up to my ear and I thought, okay, yeah, you know, and then um, being at a craft store and seeing these little succulent like stickers or whatever. And I'm like, wow, I can make those into earrings. Like just, I, I'm not a, I can't create out of, out of, you know, like, like metal Smith or whatever. But when I see something and I, and I put it up to my ear and it's like, it's not, it's not necessarily, it's not supposed to be an earring, but like, I think of a way to like, repurpose it right and it's kind of like that just watch it like just this that idea of like making something out of out of nothing but with style and with intention right and so like that definitely like I was inspired by other earring makers and then I was inspired because I like to make things out of things that you wouldn't expect and I like to wear them so like that's what that's what led to that I had another question about um Archives, how many of your archive, how many of your vinyls, sorry, are archive, archives like those uh, passed down to you from or from thrift stores? That's a great question. And then we also had one about uh, the most important thing to you about archiving. So archiving and then how many of your vinyls are archives that have been passed down or from the thrift store? Most important thing to me about archiving, um, I guess it's just the, the, the fact that it's like, preserving, preserving um, the past, right? Preserving the past and, 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 and having proof of it, right? Like I, I, I've kept, I keep letters, I keep postcards, I keep no, notes, high school notes, you know what I mean? Like I keep those things because to me, it's like, I know, I know myself and I know that like, I forget, <laughs> like, I forget, like if, if I was, if I was, if I was one of y'all in this, in this presentation right now, I would have taken a lot of notes because by next week I would have forgotten it. So like, I, I have to do that in order to remind myself, like, I like to remind myself, like where, what happened and this person might, you know, that my might not be connected to anymore. Maybe they've passed away. The thing like connects me to them. So like, I think that's the most important part to me is just the remembering that person or that event or that whatever it was, like it's a proof ticket stubs. You know what I mean? Like it just, I don't know. Like I, I, I want to remember them and the, the, the object helps me remember it. So that's the most important thing to me. And then how many of vital art archives like those passed down to you or from through? I, my, my record collection started as, um, from my mother and father's collections that my mother, you know, at a certain point in the nineties was, I'm like, CDs are in and she was going to get rid of her records. And I was, you know, 14. And I said, no, please don't. I'm going to keep them for you. I'll keep them. So I brought them into my room, you know, with her record player, because again, like they meant something to me. They're, they're records that have their names, you know, scribbled on them. Like, and like, you know, they're worn out and like, they, and I, and they meant, I was like, I can bear for her to get rid of them. So like my collection started with, with her records. And then later on, my dad died when I was in my twenties and I, I got some of his, some of his records I inherited. Um, and again, they were just proof of, of their, of their, um, I don't know, like a, a record can be a, such a part of a person, right? Like particular records are such are such important parts of our lives. That, and these were like tangible, beautiful, worn out, you know, like um, scuffed up proof of their their existence and, and then playing them over and over and over. And so like, I can put on a record from that, from, the, from those stacks and I'm hearing the same thing they heard because it's the same physical object that they would put on the turntable. So like, it's just, I don't know, it's, it's pretty cool. Somebody just said they're making their own archive without knowing it, which is exactly what I wanted, which is exactly why I invited Bonnie for this class because I am trained through graduate school to um, think about research in a particular way, right? But from my own community and from other mujeres, like this is what we do and this is why it's so important. So I never want folks to feel like your doodles or your artwork or your music interests or when you make a playlist and it took you like hours to make, like 
those things are methodological, <laughs> they're inquiry, and they're deserving of like love and study and being shared. Um, let me see if there's another question. I love that. I'm making my archive without knowing it. Well, now you know it. And now you can really like just consciously like keep building it and keep um, another uh, something I want to look into right now is um, finding like archival photo albums, because a lot of the photos I have are just in bags and just like not whatever. And I want to find a photo album that will preserve them as long as possible. You know what I mean? Like, so that's something that I want to start looking into next and just, just organizing the photos because I, I inherited my grandmother's photos and my mom's been giving me a lot of her stuff. And I'm like, I have all these little piles and I'm like, I want to put them together and do it properly, you know, properly, whatever that means. But um, And then there's another question about um, if you have a favorite pair of earrings. <laughs> I mean, Do I have a favorite pair of earrings? I don't know if I could say that I have a favorite pair. Um, I have this, I guess, okay. I have um, my mother's shrimp earrings or silver shrimp earrings that she, you know, in the nineties, they were, you know, obviously like the thing or whatever. And, and I remember her buying this particular look. Her little shrimp earrings she gave me recently and so like I feel like those are the most like sentimental to me you know because I remember her wearing she was a teacher's assistant in the 90s and like she worked really hard and, and I remember her those little I don't know so yeah I would say that my mom's my mom's shrimp are my favorites um and then I want to think about with you and of course I'd have to think more like this is just coming to me but what is a way that we can collaborate with students in the community to like have archiving slash some type of collectiva, you know, where folks become reintroduced into things they already do and like, but in a way that it's about preserving. So I'll have to think about and look for like grants <laughs> or opportunities to use the resources from the university to like set this stuff up for the community uh, and definitely will invite you. But like this, your presentation, like I want it to be like a class, <laughs> not like a traditional sense, you know, but like a workshop, like a series where folks, because I'm just so curious, like what other folks would produce and what kind of stories we would have for folks, like kind of like a codex, right? Like a codex that, um, that's in like our, our ancestor way of documenting things, like it'd be so cool to have that available. Oh yeah, I think a workshop would be uh, almost like a, a collective, right? A workshop slash collective and where, again, where it's um, non-hierarchical, where one week I'm teaching it the lesson and then like next week it's, you know, um, Christina Solis, you know, is talking about whatever. And like, you know, where we're like kind of sharing knowledge and not putting all the like, I don't want to say the brunt of the work, but like, you know, we're sharing the work, right? And like teaching each other and focusing on one thing and maybe it's recipes or maybe it's, you know, like you're saying those ancestral nopales or whatever it is and gathering our work together and then somehow like, you know, organizing it. But I think that would be like a really, a really like worthwhile thing to do, you know, because there's so much knowledge here in San Antonio, you know, and there's so much that's, that's I feel like we're at the precipice of like the city changing. The city is changing so rapidly and I don't, I know change is again, ocean, right? We're, we're in a shallow sea like millions of years ago, but I want to do all I can to <laughs> promote and preserve as much as I can, as long as I can. Because San Antonio, South Texas, it's a beautiful culture and we've been through so much, <laughs> you know, and not just in the last year, but in the last, you know, centuries or whatever. And so I feel it's very vital and very important that now to take the time to like, take a stand and like, you know, um, just remember who we are, where we come from and, and, and make every effort to like, not be whitewashed or homogenized or, or just, you know, lose all that, you know, like, we can't lose it. I don't want to lose it, you know? I'm giving you a virtual hug because that's just <laughs> my spirit. That's just how I feel about San Antonio and home and being a Chicana and being from Texas. Like that's exactly how I feel and why I even got into education and in books and learning for that exactly. Thank you for such like a beautiful and perfect and just on point presentation. Um, any other comments or questions before? I want to be, um, 
I want to honor your time and be mindful of your time. But we have a comment here. I would feel that I am not alone in hoarding <laughs> mine and my mom's belongings. Absolutely, right? Like who is going to collect information about women of color and Chicanas and Tejanas, right? Probably Mexican, <laughs> like women of Mexican descent. Yeah, that's why the article was so powerful to me when she talked about her mother's living room and how she just, you know, it's just, it seems like it's just sprawling and all this information and things everywhere. But like, I'm like, yeah, I mean, yeah, we, we, we don't get, um, we don't get archived, you know, like that whole idea of like whoever's in charge chooses who gets remembered. And so that is like, well, that's enlightening. That's good to know. And that's why we have this urge, you know, to, 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 to make sure that we, we, we don't, you know, um, get forgotten. And then this, this is something I was also going to kind of touch on. I don't know y'all saw this. Um, and I, I, I asked my, my comadre brought it to me um, the other day. And um, I was really like interested because I have a lot of, a lot. I have all the Texas monthlies. I have the people, I have a lot of Selena magazines. So I really, I was like, I need this one. And then I looked at it and it's gorgeous. I mean, I love it. It's a beautiful cover. And then it says, why Selena matters? Like that's the headline, right? Like why Selena matters? And I'm like, <laughs> who said she didn't who are you trying to convince that you know who are you telling that she matters like we don't need we know she matters. she mattered before she died she will always matter that is besides the point and so I just sort of like I don't know I just kind of wanted to bring it up you know in terms of like who gets remembered you know Selena gets remembered a lot you know her family licenses her image to we you know it, it keeps going there's a machine behind the image or whatever but we have a lot of Selena. we don't have there's only one Selena don't get me wrong but we have a lot of artists a lot of singers a lot of people who who also matter you know um and so I wanted to pull that in <laughs> before we go <laughs> So it's all crickets. Everybody's like, oh, no, she didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Any final comments or questions? For me? Or for yeah, me? For, yeah, for Bonnie. Oh, for me? Oh, any questions? Yeah, I don't know. I don't have any other. Um, my website's a great place. You want to, you know, whatever. Um, you, there's a contact form there if you have other further questions or you want to, like, whatever. Um, there's a contact form on my website where I, you know, um, I'm in, you know communication with whatever um and i don't think oh. i had also your oh. ig your instagram uh, you uh, my instagram it. yes um that's been now the style is my instagram it's on private because i'm very like i share a lot and i'm not like open to like whoever from you know <laughs> bots and stuff following me so if you if you message me like the code word will be um Selena matters. <laughs> um, code word Selena matters, and I'll I'll let you in. But like I I I don't. Like. <laughs> and also, I recommend reading the Chingona essay in um, the website for Bani Cisneros because it's an example of what she's doing. Like uh, it's talking about how she met these other amazing women artists, and then they produced this festival. And each of them are rooted in doing amazing work. So if no historian chose to write about any of them. It's documented there. The essay documents it, their work documents it. Um, and they just met each other all online too, kind of like how I met her too. And it's just so amazing. But yes, thank you so much. I know I can keep going on, sorry. That's okay. My kids haven't gone back yet, so I'm fine. I mean, I'm like, <laughs> they, they went to their dad took them to the park and I'm like, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I can still talk. <laughs> yeah, the, um, I've met as many, I've met, a lot of people I never would have met through Instagram. I've met them and I'm like, so grateful, like whatever it is, I know there's a, you know, it's double, a double-edged sword, right? Social media. But for me, the meeting and like getting to know people I would have never gotten to know is just invaluable to me. You know, like I'm here because of Instagram, literally, you know, like I met some of my best, they're like some of my best friends now, you know? And like, I, I, it's, I, I can't, I can't, you know, be too whatever, talk crap about it because it was, it's very, um, we found each other, you know? And that is the last thing I'll say too, is that um, you do provide us with an example of like intentional social media use. Like social media can be for just like passing the time at work or, you know, like just messing around. But I think you really, and I, this is what I think is so important too. You really show us how to intentionally use um, 
social media to network, to collaborate consensually, right? Uh, to build community, uh, to center other artists, um, to share tips. Like I love how you talked about how you shared with Awakate putting in a bag, you know? It's very intentional. And I think that that's also like an important praxis um, for folks to understand, like you can use your social media in very intentional and restorative ways, right? Instead of just like, and you can use it for that too. I use it for both. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it could be both, you know, um, it, it can be both. And like when you, when you, there's, there's people who are just like, like the insurgent archives I showed you, all they do is ar archive on that account. You know what I mean? It's very like serious, right? And then I think mine is a little bit of mix of both, of all kinds of stuff, but, um, yeah, like uh, it can be, it is a tool. It is a, it is a place where, you know, you can, you can really, you can build community, you know, I feel. Um, so I'm grateful for it. And um, I see the, me the message code word, Selena matters. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll be on the lookout for those. Um, but yeah, like, I'm, I'm really like, I, like I said, like reading those articles, like when you, you know, reading these articles, by uh, Maria Cotera, like really just has really like, I feel like a new, I feel new, you know what I mean? Like everything sort of came together for me. So I'm really like grateful to have been able to be with y'all tonight. And like, I just, you know, it's really cool. <laughs> no, I'm so grateful for your work. I can't say it enough. Thank you for all that you do. And thank you for being here with our class tonight. So yeah. Hi. Just so brief. And this has been recorded. So I will um, figure out how to send it to you in a easy to download file. Yes, yes. I'm going to put it up on my YouTube. I'll put it on my website and uh, <laughs> preserve. I'm like, we, we have to preserve the uh, the presentation about preservation, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Document archive, the archive presentation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, thank right. you so, so much. All right. Well, thank you all. Have a great night and keep, keep at it and keep out your studies. Yeah. Keep out. You already see there's a light at the end of the tunnel. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> you're doing great. Yes. So. Oh, that's so awesome. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks y'all. And class, you can meet me on our original their live session tab in a little bit. They're like in five minutes.